me? <laughs> and I see him out, and I, and I walked in and I said, I said, some of my shit is missing. That's what I told him. I just looked at my stuff. That new motherfucker probably been eating some of my shit. I said, some of my fucking shit's missing. And he looked at me and he goes, he goes, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to fuck you, Karate. Yeah. And I said, fuck me too. I said, I said, Lovatos, fucking me is going to make your mouth sore. And so he threw me up out of there too. And, uh, you know, it's, the fact of the matter is, is what the fuck were they going to do? You know, Smiley, they'd already told us that none of no lifers are going home. Yeah, that's when that started. Right? Yeah. You know, and they were fucking shooting and killing you over a fucking fist fight. Bamming on the security squad, shot and killed that fucking Kim homeboy of mine and fucking had sag for a fucking yeah. fist fight. Shot him right in the head. Shot and, him in the back of the head. Uh, fucking scumbags. Scumbags. For a fist fight, committing, yeah. committing straight murders yeah. on a fucking kid. You know, it's just those that see the stuff like that that happens in the pen that people don't even realize. Yeah. Or some fucking creep in a tower. It goes to fire a warning shot, shoot to kill some fucking dude on the basketball court. Yep. I mean, it's just, it's, it's insanity. It's just insanity that they can cover that shit up like they did. And then, boom, as soon as they realize, oh, we got to change the shooting policy, then they liked it even better because now you got fucking 400 guys fighting instead of just two. Yeah. And, and you know as well as I do, I liked it a whole lot better on the, with the old shooting policy because yeah, at least I mean, you weren't you know, back, in the day, uh, back in the day, I mean, you didn't have a uh, hundred guys jump on ten guys, you know, because they're not going to get shot. Um, yeah. If the guys went out out there and did it, man, it was serious shit, you know. And because yeah. because somebody was getting shot. Yeah, you know, somebody was getting, was getting shot. shot. Now they just have riots over every little knickknack bullshit thing, and yeah, and you and you know you know how that rolls. It's usually some fucking punk ass lame. It starts the riot. And so when you're out there and you're rocking and rolling and that little motherfucker's nowhere to be found, yeah. then he's locking it up. So, so uh, Lobatos was a captain, a uh, little Mexican guy. He wore skin tight jeans, like disco yeah. Dan, you know, like a straight disco, homosexual disco. Uh, he had his disco shoes on and, you know, he, mm-hmm. he got me because I was on a family visit and I was divorced and they found out and, he sent me to Cork, and I actually had another captain, actually Lieutenant Pawa. I knew him when he worked in Chino and shit. And he's like, hey, dude, I would help you out. I would go ask that guy to give you a break. But then he's going to ask me, why are you interested in this guy? And he's going to investigate me. He, Lobatos was this straight asshole. With his big old pompadour hairdo, yeah, bro. Yeah, yeah. He was, you know, he was just a little paisa. Yeah, you know, he lived in paisa. Tijuana, right? Yeah. He lived in Tijuana, made all that money as a captain. He lived in Tijuana. Yeah, you know what a punk. Uh, he sent me to Corcoran. Yeah. yeah, well, I got to Corcoran eventually, but it wasn't from Donovan. Yeah, I went to old Corcoran level four, you know. Yeah, we were on the we yeah, I was in three B O five there for a while. And I think that you were on three B R two, weren't you? Yeah, I was in three B O four. Yeah. It was when I started getting really good with legal work, I filed a six oh two on uh, my physical therapy. And so they gave me some fucking bus therapy and they sent me up to Corkin for physical therapy from Chuckawalla. Yeah. I said, dirty. As dirty as they come. Three, three and I got there, right? Nazi, pretty nice. Really, I liked it. Yeah, it was nice. I had got there when it was on a state of emergency from the April Fool's Day riot where uh, where the Mex- Mexicans jumped up and stabbed all the white boys in the chow hall. So there was still blood all over the walls when I yeah, got they there. they were doing that when I was there. I got there in 96, 97, 98. Um, you know, there was a, there was a ride with the blacks and the Mexicans when I got there at the Southsiders and, and, uh, they were locked down for like four months straight and only people on the yard were whites and we had fun. We were partying like crazy, you know, what I liked about Cork was San San Luis Obispo when they were bringing the Northerners down, remember, and integrating the Northerners? Yeah. What I liked about Cork when it was run by old school cops. So if they had a stabbing. You know, they would lock down the race involved till they figured out what was going on. Everybody else could be out, whatever, you know. Yeah. But uh, I remember one day they were stabbing this dude. I was in the corner waiting to go out on a visit. They got to pop the gate, you know. You ring the buzzer, and they pop the gate, and you walk over to the visiting room. And they were stabbing this dude right in front of the program office. They stabbed him like 25 times. And I'm pushing the button, pushing the button. 
come on, man, open it. The gate popped. I walked in the visiting room and the alarm went off. I was like, what? Because I knew it. Yeah, if they seen that, you know, I would have to get down on the yard and I would have missed uh, my You were stuck. Yeah. You wouldn't go nowhere. Yeah. You know, it's amazing that how, how desensitized we get, brother. You yeah. know what I mean? If that would have been your first day in prison, you'd have been going, holy shit. Yeah. Now, I remember how many times somebody come running by me on a yard and you see the, their T-shirt just growing this big red bloom no. and go, fuck, I'm going to yeah. miss my goddamn phone call. Yeah, that's I'm not give a shit about him. Or, I just, you know, now I'm gonna have to bird bath. You know, you see so much uh, violence and stabbings. You know, California prison system, man. Over, you know, it's just uh, it's just standard. It's just another day. It's like, oh yeah, you know, don't squirt, don't squirt that shit on me. You know, it just that's yeah, that's bad. what's funny about it. you. You you listen to some of these clowns, I call them, yeah. that have these convict shows, Mitch. And they, 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 they spin this fairy tale about going out and stabbing 15 guys in one day or, you know, or fighting 30 guys. And, and you just go, what are you fucking kidding me? First of all, the biggest and baddest dude in the joint can get got right now. Yeah. Get got. And you're not stabbing, you, you're not stabbing 30 dudes in the joint. No, I mean, come on, bro. You're not, 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 not before breakfast anyway. No, as soon as maybe they, over a long yard, period of time. The yard you, don't run, you don't run into that many people that need to be stabbed by you. No, you know, no, you know. it's just ridiculous. No, yeah. certainly you might run into, you know, half a dozen guys that might get stabbed as a result of you. Uh, but, but again, you know what I mean? There's a, the reality is that shit happens in prison that no, that, that, uh, that people can't believe. But, but don't believe some of the shit that you do here because it just That's, can't happen. It's bullshit, you know? You know what I mean? And all these guys, they're, some of them I remember, they, they didn't seem as tough in prison as they seem on their YouTube channel. No, they, no. You know? Not hardly. It's a lot. You know, you can reinvent yourself however you want to once it's behind you. Yeah. You know? Well, that's, when just you're like, in there, it's a whole, you know. Well, you can go poof. I'm an Iraqi jet fighter pilot. Yeah. You can be all you want to be. But the reality is, is you uh, made it through Corcoran and, yeah. and uh, then you ended up uh, for a while. Said, you, you were over in uh, level two, new Corcoran too, right? I was, I was uh, at Sat F. I was at Sat F uh, for, uh, that was, that was a long time into my sentence. I was, I went there. Well, what happened is, uh, the bottles finally got rid of me out of Donovan. Yeah. Sent me out to Tatchby. And Tatchby was heaven compared to Donovan. That place, that was as sweet as could be. Badass band program, badass hobby. You can sell shit out in front to the visitors when they came in for the hobby. You yeah. can get your own hobby room. Great softball program, tennis courts, they had it all. And, uh, you know, at that point, they started coming uh, two lifers or one lifer and some other longer term, but one of them was a rapo. Uh, they escaped from CRC, 1997. And yeah. so they had a knee jerk reaction and said all lifers have to be housed behind electrical fence. And so they talk, they talk about how they clown a fucking population. At that time, there's 302 lifers in Tatchby, level two. And yeah. the cops were the last ones that wanted to see us leave because as soon as we left, they had major riots there. So 302 lifers there. And they may have put a sign out in front of the classification because everybody went to committee within a week. Yeah. And, and you're sort of sitting out there with each other, where do you want to go, brother? And everyone's picking different pens. They, so you could pick and you tell them in there, okay, that's what put you up. Everybody went to the same fucking place. They sent us all this fucking Solano where they had built these barns on the yard in between buildings. Oh, really? Yeah. So, so we get there and, and we're not in a real good mood. And what was interesting, the first night that we get there, they put us in there without giving us our property. And so nobody had any cigarettes. And so at nine o'clock, we'd had, on day two, nine o'clock, we'd had enough that we decided we're gonna do a sit down. And so at nine o'clock, they, when, they, when the cops told uh, everyone to get to their racks, you know, we said, hey, fuck you, go get the lieutenant. <clears throat> and we, yeah. all, we sat down on the benches. Well, there's 200 guys in this building, about 160 of us sat on the benches, 40, Motherfuckers were still in their in scared to death, and they were in their bumps. 
for him when they're boxed. Uh, Janet came in. We told him what, what was the problem was. He goes, I'll be right back. He came back in and he put two cans of tobacco down for every race. And he goes, I'll get you guys property tomorrow. We all go to bed at three o'clock, the gun towers, the gun the ports, gun ports open up, boom, and two gunners walk in on each side of the day room. And they took the fucking 40 dudes that didn't participate in the strike. They took them to the hold for their safety and did nothing to us. <laughs> so, so those dudes think there's that was that. I thought that was, see, that's old school right there. Because you know, the next day, some people were about ready to get their asses whooped up in there yeah. for, uh, for failing to participate. And yeah. so, yeah, they came in and they had the ID cards of everybody that had stayed in the rack because they took all our ID cards, right? Yeah. And when he left, he put those on the benches and we didn't know he left with the ID cards of the guys that were lying in their bunks. And they came and locked every one of them dudes up at three o'clock in the morning with gunners posted. For their own safety you know because that's that was that was old school back then right back that's when guys stuck together that's when you realize that you were stronger together than you are apart but the bottom line is is they they won because i went back to tatchby again uh, 10 years later so we go to solano a year later uh solano's rock and roll you know it's good pen two level twos two level threes uh i remember i mean there's a lot of action that's where i met wayne bulldog lad you know we Wayne was a good dude, man. Uh, then, uh, away since then. Uh, yeah, he passed away from Pittsburgh, yeah. California. And that was a man that, uh, that was a good dude, man. Yeah. I don't care. You know what I mean? He's a good dude. I do look just like a fucking bulldog, too. But if you read the book, The Animal Factory and Folsom, him and Mike Rizzatello, you know what I mean? If anybody can say what they want to say when somebody's in the ground, but they wouldn't have said it when Wayne was on the yard unless you're ready to have a fight for real. Uh, well, I don't know anybody that ever really talked bad about, about him, you know? No, no he was, that's, so. well, you know, th these stories happen, you know what I mean? People have these fucking dreams, and then they wake up, and all of a sudden, it's a reality for them. But yeah. Wayne was a little Irishman, and what's amazing is, I don't know how he did it. You you could go out on the yard and smoke a joint with Wayne, and, and you could be with 10 guys, but every second, Wayne's handing you a joint. While one's going around, he's, he's being – you're just back and forth, back and forth. And it was just, it was, he was, he was, uh, he was certainly my, uh, my biggest mentor in, in California prison system. An old school gangster, you know? Yeah. And uh, Mike Rizzatello, who was at Donovan, I mean, at Chuckawalla, Mike Rizzatello is a hit man for the mafia. Yeah. Uh, Mike Rizzatello, he came up and he goes, Hey man, were you, were you the one that had the action with Julie Rizzo? And he said, yeah. And he goes, he goes, Hey man, that guy would be thinking what a bad rap you got. I just want you to know that. So all these stories about the mob, you're going to hit you when you're in the pen. Uh, it, number one, I didn't care. Number two, it was, you know, was, that's that's another one of the stories that they create. So uh, just uh, um, now, the, the guy who died in this uh, collision accident, he had a couple sons. Now, he was like, uh, he was a gangster too as well, right? He was, he was a main man in the mob. And so he had a couple man. sons too, right? Yeah, he had a son named Joseph uh, who lived in Florida, and a son named uh, 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 he had a oh man. So didn't they? Uh, yeah, like say, was, didn't another they, son who was a, a pit boss in Vegas. Yeah, so didn't they like Willie? Forgive, forgive, Willie and Joseph. Didn't they forgive you or say you'd done enough time or something like that? They did. Uh, they did in two thousand and ten. Two thousand and ten. It was. Uh, I'd been down for 18 years then. I was going to my fourth parole hearing in front of uh, uh, some bitch named Crohn's. Used to be a warden at uh, San Quentin. Yeah. She was a scumbag. The The LA Times was in there doing a, a, an article on me. And so she, she did this fucking dog and pony dance. I had, I had a seven and a half hour board hearing. God. Seven and a half hours, bro. Man. And I was just... I was just, by the time she gave me a multiple year denial, I just looked at her and I just, and it was just, all it was was a show yeah. for the Los Angeles Times because a week later it was a full featured article in the LA Times. So did they write a letter to the board for you? They did. They wrote a letter to the board and they said that uh, uh, our father had four children, an adopted daughter and my brother and I and our, and our sister. And uh, they said, you know, so the adopted daughter and William Joseph wrote letters in support of parole. 
I said, you know, their father uh, would want me to get back to my life and back to my children. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was, that's pretty cool. It was, it was incredibly humbling yeah. experience, you know, because, you know, it, I remember I sat, my buddy, uh, Steve Tolan had told me that they had written letters and, and I sat down and I, and I asked him, I said, will they accept a, an apology letter from me? And, uh, he said, yeah. And I sat down and, and, uh, in a cell and I wrote a letter that was, it was the hardest letter I ever wrote in my life. Yeah. And when I got done, it was like 17 pages. And so I ripped that up and threw it away. And I finally got it down to a page and a half, you know, of a week of writing this letter. And uh, you know what, you know, how do you, it's, it's difficult to say, right? Uh, but at that point in my life, I didn't realize what the sheriff's department had done to me. So if we get to a point where we just say, you know, maybe, maybe I wasn't thinking. Maybe I could have been going, who knows, you know, because yeah. you start for so many years, you, now you start to believe the lie yourself. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and so, but, but irregardless of that, to me, you know, as, as a man, I knew that it took so much, it took so much uh, forgiveness on their part that even if I knew that, I would never have said anything to them. Right. I would have just owned it. And told them what I said. And I said, I that your father must have been a man's man, an incredible human being. Because for you to, to give me what I'd been looking for for all these years, you know, peace of mind, for you to tell me that uh, you forgive me, I said, that only tells me how amazing your father must have been. Yeah, because you you don't raise boys like that unless you're a good man, and you know, gangster, a gangster is a gangster. Their father was a gangster. Their father was a gangster for real. You know, he's made man of the mafia family. Yeah. Uh, Frank Sinatra showed his power with their father because of, of about six months before my collision, see, Mr. Rizzo actually in reality shouldn't have even been at that intersection because him and his crime partners had just been found guilty in federal court in New York for embezzling 15 or 5 million or something from this casino in the Pocono mountains. But Frank Sinatra got him released to his custody. All his crime partners went to the pen. Jilly went to Frank Sinatra's neighborhood. So about eight, six, seven years after I'd been in prison, my family gets contacted by a guy named Tony Anthony Del Vecchio. Tony Del Vecchio was one of Mr. Rizzo's crime partners, and he had just got out of federal prison, and he was starting this radio show in Baltimore called Ask Tony, where you could call into a radio station, and you could speak to a made man in the mob and get his opinion on something. So they would call him, hey, Tony, you know, hey, this son of a bitch over here, he took my fucking car, and Tony said, well, and Tony would give you advice, and uh, <laughs> it was about how to handle it. You know, you go buy a lead pipe, first of all. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, get some concrete. But, uh, you know, the reality is that uh, he called my, called my father-in-law and he said, uh, he said, you know, I want to help. I want to help you out. He goes, your son-in-law doesn't belong in prison. And uh, he started writing letters in support of parole. Uh, the individuals who were part of Sinatra's camp, uh, one of them, a guy named Marty Funier. He was in the Notre Dame Hall of Fame. He was a Hall of Fame trainer for, uh, the Notre, for Notre Dame. And uh, he was actually... What convinced him is he was a trainer at Cathedral City High School. And my son was playing football there. And my son was an all-star baseball player there. I remember I'd call my wife every Friday night between 8 and 9. And for 15 minutes, she'd hold the phone up in the air. And every once in a while, I'd hear, every once in a while, I would hear another tackle, number seven, Jeff Barati. You know, and, and I would just close my eyes and imagine. Yeah, just, uh, yeah. But uh, so, yeah, so they, they wrote letters in support of parole. And, uh, and so, you know, I wrote him a letter and, and let him know that, uh, you know, no matter what happens, that uh, I was grateful and that, uh, you know, that uh, it, uh, it meant the world to me. So, but uh, the daughter and Nancy Sinatra, well, that was another story. Was, uh, and and they, uh, they said, you know, we would talk to her, but uh, uh, we'd end up killing her. That's what they told me. Yeah. And uh, as they said that she was a nut job, she said she only came around her father when she wanted money, and she didn't give a shit about her father. 
and that this was all uh, just a play. So she would make sure that she stirred up all the uh, haters, you know, the crime victims, families, the Tate Foundation. So when I went to the parole board, I went with about 2,500 letters of opposition every time. Yeah. So um, you ended up, you know, last time I saw you was CMC West. And yeah. you're working the Art Shack Canteen. You've been found suitable a few times. Yeah. And I'd, won, I'd won a pro per writ. I became a self-taught jailhouse lawyer. Yeah. I probably got more guys out of prison than all active than the active attorneys in the state of California right now. Yeah, because nobody cares about your dirty ass boxers more than you. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I, I, you know, Mitch, I, I knew, I felt in my heart that if I didn't become an attorney and be in a position to be able to fight for my life, that I was going to die in prison, and I didn't want to die in prison. Well, hell, when I met you, I was like, you know, fuck it, I'm going to die in this motherfucker, and you know, no. Well, I was really yeah. on the end of end trail before I changed yeah. my mindset. That was like when I was really yeah. like, hey, this is it. You know, I'm going to die here. Well, what's interesting is you met me during two different mindsets, right? You met me when I was learning the trade, right? And yeah. then you met me when I was at the top of my game. And uh, yeah. so, you know, I we, we didn't take a thimble of shit from nobody. Yeah. Never once. And, uh, you know, never yeah. once. And, uh, you know, they, they, uh, the bottom line is, uh, you know, I tell, I used to always, I used to always lie to myself, you know, that there's, there's no way in the world I'm going to become institutionalized. No way. That there's no way I'm going to let this get into me. I'm going to be the same kind hearted, loving, caring guy that came into the system. But uh, that's not the system that I went into. Yeah. Uh, and then the fact that I became a target for the cops almost from day one. So, you know, they either loved me or they hated me. Right. No in between. And so I try to manipulate it for the best that I could. But uh, but I also manipulate for what was good for the whites. You know what I mean? I was in prison and I and I and I was going to represent uh, what what needed to be represented. They told me a set of rules and that if you follow these rules, there's a good chance you might live through this shit. Uh, but if you don't, there's a good chance where you might die. Yeah. And so those rules became a part of my life and I'm still trying to shake them right now. You know what I mean? I, there's still, there's used, I still hear words said or people raise their voice. And I feel like, you know, you know, responding in the way that uh, is not healthy in this environment. It's not healthy uh, in any environment, it's certainly not healthy in prison, but because, uh, you know, it, uh, fire on your ass in a second before you disrespect me in the pen. That's, that's just bottom line. And uh, so and so would anybody else, because that's what you have to do. Oh, that's what prison yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. But I tell you, with, I told you I did the analogy about the wet paint, right? Yeah. Did yeah. I share that with you? Yeah. 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 Maybe because a lot of people ask me, what was prison? Why? What's prison like? How does, you know, how does it become? What happens? how do you transform from the life of a successful businessman to that of a convict? Where do you get that mindset from? Where, when, do you know, when does the switch go on? You know, you really can't say, you really don't say, but I tell him, I said, imagine, imagine that you lived, you had a nice home and you just painted your bedroom and you knew that the paint was wet and you knew that the paint was never going to dry. So you move your furniture a little bit away from the wall, but you, there, you had to live there. It may take 10 years. It may take 12. Who knows? But one day you're going to be in the mirror, you could be combing your hair, and you're going to go, son of a bitch. And you're going to see a little bit of wet paint, you go, and you're not going to remember when you touch the wall. You're not going to remember even brushing into the wall, but you're going to have some paint there. And then a few more years will go by, Mitch, and you comb in your hair, and you turn around, and you see a big old swatch of paint on your shoulder, and you go, Fuck! How the fuck did I do that? I didn't bump into the wall. Well, that's prison because you cannot live in that environment without it beginning to live in you. Yeah. You know, it, it begins to, you know, when Nietzsche said, the more you look into the abyss, the more the abyss looks into you. Yeah. Uh, you know, my buddy, my buddy Donnie Briegel, you remember Donnie Briegel from Donovan? The skinny dude came up from YA after they killed the counselor and put her in the dumpster. 
No, like I don't remember. Center. He had a, he had a badass Viking bitch tattooed right here. Uh, and it was, but uh, he had, he had, he had said he had, he had written uh, one day. I, I don't know. I was having a bad day. I think I think Jack Burns and some had pissed me off, and so I walked in and told him, "Skinny Mike, get the fuck up. We're gonna handle this right now. I'm gonna beat the shit out of both of them." And uh, and they broke it down like a four ten shotgun. But the bottom line is, is that it's just a bad day. And, and Donnie came in and he handed me a, a poem that he'd written. And it said, there are bubbles in the air. We step in them and we step out of them, but hopefully we do not lose ourselves. And because he, he saw me losing myself, you know, I was becoming this angry, big, strong guy that I, that had nothing to do with who I was, yeah. you know, not who do I was, buddy, but I became a self-taught attorney. And when I met you, I'd won my case. And what you want to talk about full circle, right? Uh, full circle is that the judge that granted that rid of habeas corpus that resulted in me getting out of prison almost four years later because I got found suitable and punk ass Brown took my date, probably right. driven drunk a million fucking times, scumbag, yeah, hypocrite, piece of shit. Uh, he pulled my date. And then, it, then I went back got found suitable and then the board all of a sudden made a mistake. So they have to hold a new hearing that takes another year. Right. So they, they were doing everything they could to slow down. To I know I sat with you a couple of times when you got found suitable. Yeah. You know, I was like, you know, I just try to encourage you, you know? <laughs> yeah. And you were encouragement because I got to see two sides of you too, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> see, I had become who you were when I met you Yeah. and you had become a little bit more, you know, a little bit more laid back, but I but I know what it was. We become a little bit more aware of uh, that life doesn't last forever. We yeah. become a little bit more aware that I don't want to die here, you know. And uh, and then the people that we love are dying. Yeah, you know the, the the things that we care about they're not there no more. And uh, you know, thank God, thank God you made it out. For your mom, you know, yeah, thank God, your mom, you know, yeah, before she passes. But uh, yeah. I also got to get uh, back with my wife, and uh, yeah. you know, have a life. Yeah. Well, you know, I come back to upstate New York to work, but I don't come here. That's not the motivation. My father, my father was was my hero. You know what I mean? Because I got to meet my father. I remember I was visiting with him in the visiting room in Chuckawalla. And I knew that it was going to be the last time I saw my father alive. Yeah. And it was, and my father had stopped drinking for the first time in his life for six yeah. months because he was in hospice. And, uh, and we went out on the patio and uh, I sat there and I asked my dad question after question, you know, tell me about this. Tell me about Vietnam. Tell me about these things that you never talked about. And, you know, my father looked at me and he said, he goes, uh, he said, you know, uh, Man, I, I'm sorry. But, but you know, the reality is, there. He's not. What, he didn't do a fucking thing to get me in the joint. I did. You know what I mean? I'm the one that made those decisions. But uh, so, but what's, but what's interesting is, is I come back because he's buried up here, and. Uh, you know, it's it's cool to be able to uh, it, it's cool to be able to stand in front of a grave and not have any regrets. You know that uh, that uh, you didn't. Uh, at least I know that uh, I never uh, never once. I, I think about it, and I never once raised my voice to my dad. I never called him a name. Yeah. Uh, I never uh, I never told him all that's bullshit. You know what I mean. I listened to my dad. My dad, my dad was known in Upper New York State. I come back here too because my name has a good name in Upstate New York. My cousin Mike is a famous race car driver up here. My uncle Lee is a big developer. My grandfather was a judge. My uncle was a chief of police. You know, my name. They, I don't have to get clients to sign a contract with me up here. I give them a handshake because yeah. handshake matters in this part of the country, and they know that if. If a parati tells them something, then they, you can take it to the fucking bank. 
but I come back and I, and I see my dad once a year because uh, he's so far away. You know, nobody, nobody comes to see my dad. I've, I, I come out at least once or twice a year. I uh, go to see my sister who died while I was in touch via bone cancer. And, uh, you know, this fucking Cinco de Mayo seems to be a fucking date is a gift that just keeps on giving because on the fifth, that's when my collision occurred. But on the 15th year anniversary, I called home to speak to my sister, Ann, who was my best friend. And uh, she told me that she had woke up with double vision and she was dead six months later of uh, bone cancer. But uh, you know, I remember one thing about Ann, she wrote me every day, Mitch. She wrote me because she knew that I, she knew that one day I'd prove my innocence. That's what she told me. She goes, I know one day you'll prove it, Jeffrey. And so she wrote me, when she went on vacation, she'd take seven envelopes of seven pieces of paper or 10, however many days she was gonna be gone. So when I was in solitary confinement, fight and validation attempts uh, or for bullshit, uh, I always got a letter every day from my sister. I knew no like fucking clockwork that they, they if I didn't get a letter that day, then that means one of those punk ass screws was fucking with me and keeping my mail. I also knew when ISU was investigating me because my sister's letter didn't show up. So I knew automatically they're they intercepting my mail. There was telling cops when I was in the hole. I tell me hey, you're fucking with my mail, aren't you? You know, <laughs> you know, I think uh, that guy's a nut, you know, but uh, uh, they do talk with mail. I knew. When Geronimo Pratt was my neighbor yeah. in Donovan, they used to give me his mail. And then yeah. wink, wink, you know, like, ha, ha, yeah. you know. And then well, when I tell you what, from back, the, I go, hey, here's your mail, you know. From the day that my sister told me she was sick until the day that she died six months later, the first thing I did in Tatchby is I got up, went to the band room, and I wrote my sister a letter because I wanted her to know how much those – because I knew how much those letters meant to me. You know what I mean? I was sitting there at the side of my bunk, and I was going, what how the fuck – what can I give my sister that she could take with her? And I'd carried this little Bible around with me. I'd carried it through wars. And uh, I said, fuck it, man. I just laid my hand open and I held on his Bible and I soaked it through with blood all the way until it was dripping. And uh, I put it in my locker and I let it dry. And I mailed that to my sister. And I asked her, you know, to take, take this with you. So you always have me, a part of me with you. And uh, she was fucking pissed at me bro she said how could you hurt yourself and i said it it didn't even hurt you know what i mean it didn't hurt but uh the reality is that you know we it's uh well, you it's not the time you know it's not the time brother it's the cocksuckers you got to do the time with number one and it's and it's we just hope we make it out before that one person dies yep that's all yep and uh you know what I mean? You, but you know, you've already you, you've tasted. I mean, and then you hope that the day will come when you can be sitting at a beach and you can drink the tears of your enemies, because that's 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 the next step, right? Is to hold people accountable. Well, so got out, and uh, you know we have to go live here in about ten minutes. So uh, we're gonna have to have another a second part on this. Later, yeah. brother. Because your story continues. Uh, after you're released. <laughs> yeah, after I was released, I thought that was the end. But in uh, many under, in many many uh, different lights, that was actually just the beginning. And uh, and you know, it was both a nightmare and enlightening at the same time. Because had they not fucked me over and sent me back to prison, I wouldn't know that I was wrongfully convicted. I wouldn't know all these things that I'm gonna about ready to shove up their ass. So. <laughs> That's for sure.